Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this next episode. Um, I have a very special one for you uh, today. Uh, this is episode number 222, and um, just, um, just this day really, um, I have come across this one particular message by Leonard Ravenhill. If you're not familiar with uh, who this man was and really continues to be even in our generation and subsequent ones until the Lord returns, um, you're, you're in for a wonderful treat. Um, I believe he went on to be with the Lord maybe in 1994, um, but just a powerful uh, revivalist um, and uh, really spoke a, a prophetic word um, urging the the nation and nations uh, to turn to God, devote themselves uh, to repentance unto Him, uh, living in uh, a holy and righteous life. It's um, he's just a wealth of uh, treasure from the Lord, written many books. Um, so if you're not familiar with Leonard Ravenhill, please take the time, do yourself uh, the blessing of uh, looking into him. Um, his messages are guaranteed to pierce your heart and soul. Um, and I urge you, if if he if his message is not one that you're accustomed to receiving, um, don't stop it prematurely. Um, this is a two-part message because it wouldn't fit on, on one recording. Uh, so there is part one and part two. Um, and in this one, he begins um, with a, a song. Um, the quality is is older. I believe it was early 90, 91, 92 when this was recorded. He's in the last kind of days of his life. Um, I believe uh, he lived to be uh, close to 90 years old. Um, so um, just be patient and bear with us on the quality of this. Um, but it was something that I just felt a real urgency to, to put out. Um, and I, um, I could not say it better or add to it. So I thought, let's, you know, I'm just going to put this out there as it is, and who better to say it than the man himself? Um, so, please um, give give your full heart and attention, your mind, um, and any pushback you may feel from it. Um, please, you know, let the Lord use it, uh, let it minister to you as it has ministered to me and impacted me even this very day. So. Um, uh, thanks for being with me on this one, and uh, this will be part one of Leonard Ravenhill's message entitled, Where's the Fire? Are we having the lights on all the time? The lights? The lights I don't mind the walking in the lights, but I can't preach in it. <laughs> I couldn't see who was here, and then I saw my... Three Hebrew friends here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Came all the way from Tyler, isn't that great? Okay. Okay. Okay, I want you to stand and sing. Really sing. Holy, holy, holy. Two stanzas. Can you play that? Holy, holy. 
holy, holy, all the saints adore thee. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crown around the glassy sea. darkness hide thee. You remember that? Father, we are grateful tonight <coughs> for this pre privilege of coming into your presence. We are so glad we don't have to build an altar. We don't have to shed the blood of bulls and goats. We thank you for the blood that shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. We thank you for our high priest after 2,000 years in your presence, still living to make intercession for us. Lord, we, uh, I think just now the great statesman years ago who said, I wonder what would happen if God got tired of humanity. Lord, we wonder what would happen if you suddenly withdrew your power from your church, if you haven't already done that. We blundered in blindness. We've been so satisfied and content. Lord God, we've not moved on. We've not possessed our possessions. We're not mature yet. We're still infants. And we cannot inherit our rights in Jesus Christ until we become the true sons of God. Breathe on us, breath of God, tonight. Lord, wedge us in somewhere between infinity and eternity tonight. Lord, do what we've never seen you do before. Give us ears to hear and give us willing hearts. Lord, we are in the midst of a, we're a little colony of believers in a world of five billion rebels and sinners. They love darkness more than right. They love wrong more than right. They love pollution more than, love pollution more than purity. <coughs> they love to live in a state of constant rebellion against laws. They trample underfoot your laws. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy even with America today. We've broken your Ten Commandments ten million times before, after the sun rose this morning. And Lord, at this very moment, while we're here, nightclubs are filled, brothels are filled, gambling saloons are filled, and your house is almost empty over the nation. Lord God, save us from this horrible one hour of holiness every Sunday morning and the rest of the week in carnality. We can truly say tonight, beyond the sacred page, we seek thee, Lord. Your servant Malachi said, The Lord whom ye seek, Lord, we're not seeking miracles tonight. We're not seeking healing tonight. We're not seeking some spectacular thing. We're seeking God. Yeah. As Wesley said, Less than thyself, O do not give. In might thyself within us live. Come all thou hast and art. Lord, stretch our horizons tonight. Deepen our compassion. Quicken us with the fire that comes from heaven. 
Help us to realize and even feel tonight our God is consuming fire. Lord God, start a fire in some heart tonight that no waters of discouragement will put out. Start a fire that somebody alive in God will go to some other country and set that country ablaze. Lord God, we're not seeking some narrow little selfish blessing to relieve us of a little tension. We're asking to be God-filled men, God-possessed men, God-intoxicated men. Lord God, get somebody here tonight drunk in God who will never become sober again. Lord, we can't play games. It's too late. We're on the edge of judgment for our nation and for the world. So Lord, we pray thee, bless your sacred word to our hearts, burn it in. Help us to glorify you. May we remember this and talk about this meeting in eternity. Not just tomorrow, not at the end of this crusade or whatever it is. Not at the end of the week or the end of the month. But Lord, in eternity we'll say, Sunday began there that night. It was not born of man, it was born of God. It was not born for time, it was born for eternity. Lord, we don't blush, I don't blush to nail you tonight. I'm greedy for blessing. I'm greedy for anointing. I'm greedy for revelation. Not for myself, but for the whole that's here tonight. Lord, this meeting is by divine appointment. I don't believe Dr. Brother Tim called us together. You called us together. Not to hear the voice of the man, but to hear the voice of God. So, Lord, don't stop our ears. Give us the grace of concentration. Glorify Jesus. That's all we ask. And we ask it for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Be seated. Thank you. As our brother was singing tonight, I <coughs> thought of a meeting I went to some uh, quite a while ago. And the director met me when I got there. And he said, you'll be speaking tonight. I said, well, that's Okay. And he said, we have a young man, a very remarkable young man. So I wondered what was remarkable. <coughs> he said he writes his own songs. I said, I'll tell you something more remarkable. He said, what? I said, I write my own sermons. <laughs> we don't have to trade John Wesley stuff. <laughs> as good as it was. Oh, no, Tim Luther. Okay. How many hours do I have to see? Shall we take a break at midnight? Will that be all right, Brayson? <laughs> good, good, good. Don't tempt me. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I've had a habit for at least 60 of my 83 years of gathering books. Uh, I don't have many, maybe I have 3,000, that's not many. I have two friends who both have 25,000. Uh, but uh, I'm just thinking of the many volumes uh, of biographies or autobiographies, which I like so much, uh, written in two volumes. For instance, there's a very wonderful life of the founder of the China Inland Mission, Hudson Taylor, a big fat volume. Number one is the growth of a soul, explaining the expansion of the young man's personal relationship with God. The second one is the growth of a work, explaining the expansion of the work when he went to inland China without money and saw a mar marvelous revival of the Spirit of God. There are two great volumes written by Begbie on the life of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And there are many other wonderful life stories I'd like to tell you about, but I, I need the time. But only God could write the life story of a man in two words. One of the greatest men that ever crossed the bridge of time. He strangled the economy of a nation. The army turned out looking for a preacher. He shut up heaven so that there'd be no rain. He defied hundreds of prophets. He brought fire from heaven. He brought rain from heaven. He, he brought life where there was death and yet his whole life is summed up about 3,000 years after he 
ministered in two words in the epistle of James he prayed I wonder how many we dare write that on the, as an epitaph for how many preachers maybe we have to write on their gra- gravestones they prayed not how many of you men are known as men of prayer I wonder not many but then when it says he prayed immediately after it says he prayed again because he locked up heaven and then when he prayed he released heaven otherwise we may have had no rain until today he shut up heaven and he released heaven but not only did he pray he prayed again not only did he pray he prayed before he prayed you know this story uh, makes very real to me anyhow that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts look for, for a moment by the way I usually tell people I'm reading from the uh, what version now Bill Cook what I usually say Bill oh yes oh thank you <laughs> I'm reading from the living Bible then everybody feels comfortable that you read for that silly revelation you know there are only ten versions five are wise and five are foolish did you get that? <laughs> I'm just checking to see if you're sleeping. It's warm in here. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, preaching from again that version tonight. I'm preaching from the Living Bible. Yes. No. I'm preaching from the NIV tonight. The Never Improved Version, King James. <laughs> so you are awake thank you okay reading from this great version one the book of kings first book of kings and the 17th chapter and Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead said unto Ahab as the Lord God of Israel before whom I stand there shall be no dew nor rain upon these years listen according to God's word they didn't say that what did he say he said according to to my word you see there are areas in faith obviously many of you read about how many of you read about something somebody read something about Smith Wigglesworth did you ever read that some of you well he wasn't a Baptist so he, I, I won't tell anybody to raise your hand he was a Pentecostal isn't that terrible <coughs> but you know that man got so bold in God a man came into his meeting one night with no feet and he wanted prayer so the man of God looked at him and said go buy some shoes what? joking about me having no feet the man went home and in the middle of the night he said that preacher scorned me I have no feet he said "All right." and you imagine the miracle he said what did the man of God tell you to do he said buy shoes but I have no feet well he said do as the man says so he went to a shoe shop the next morning and he said to the man hey the man said can I help you he said yes I need shoes and the man said yes you've no feet he said no what do you want I want shoes what size he said eight what color he said black and he got them and he put them down what do you want me to do put them on my feet you have no feet well stick them on the stump he didn't the foot grew like that what do you think he did being a Pentecostal he was a shout he was a Baptist he said well that's, that's good <laughs> so then he said put your other foot out and he put the shoe on the other man and, and the foot came immediately that man realized that God is the same yesterday and forever we've been through all that syndrome before it's very good I lived in the days in England in 1925 up to 40 when miracles like that happened continually almost every night you could get an auditorium that was empty one night and packed to the rafters the next night and people got out and went round the building and lined up for the meeting the next afternoon at three o'clock that's revival when nobody wants to go to work people don't want to eat they don't want to talk they don't want sports the movie houses nobody wanted to go God was there you see we've got to get to the back place again I believe God is the same our God is a consuming fire and you never have to advertise fire whether it's physical or spiritual you've got a bumper sticker on your car with a silly doll at the end smiling smile God loves you put at the other end our God your God is a consuming fire you maybe lose your car 
But you may be winning somebody to the Lord anyhow, but God is a consuming fire. And the reason millions of billions of people are going to hell fire tonight is the church has lost Holy Ghost fire. Do you know what? I believe this meeting is the most important meeting in America tonight. It is not. I'm a fool to be here. I don't have time to come. I'm five years behind on two books I'm trying to write. I could have gone to a conference this week. Boy, would they have given me a check this size. Why get a check that size when Tim will give me one that size? I made a promise and I kept my promise. I made a promise to God weeks ago that from then until Christmas I'm not going to be public. I'm not going to take invitations. And then Martha said, you promised uh, Brother Timley. I said, well, I'll go because I made a promise. Then on the 24th of this month, I'm going to the Little Baptist Church there in Common Ground on the Sunday morning. Apart from that, unless Brother uh, Bracey chases me, I'm not going anywhere till next year. I'm going to get away with God and be quiet and hear God's voice. We're living on the edge of the greatest disaster in history. Look at this for a minute. I'm of the inhabitants of, we don't care a hill of beans where he came from. You don't know his pedigree, you don't know his father, you don't know his mother, you don't know his nationality hardly, at least you don't know where he came from. You can't find thieves. He's a Tishbite, where's that? You can't find it on a Bible map. But there he was. But I say God's ways are not our ways. Why? What does it say here? Verse 2 says, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith. Hide thyself? Now look at the conditions this man comes to. Who is this man? He's in a bracket of the most amazing men that ever walked this planet. Smart men walk on the moon. Men that want to risk their lives walk on the ocean just off the coast of Florida. But men who are smarter than either the scientists or the others, they're the men that walk with God. This is the man Elijah who walked with God. And God gave him revelation and authority. You see, he's in that bracket again. He is a prophet. Did you get that? All over the nation. Last year I got invitations all over. Come to a prophetic conference. The year before I got one. Come and meet with 120 prophets from all over the world. They're going to meet on Mount Carmel. Come and be with this distinguished group of prophets. For three days on Mount Carmel. The very place where Elijah stood. And I said to my class, my Friday night class, there's 120 men going to meet on that mountain for three days. I think they're staying in the same hotel that Elijah stayed in. Do you think they did? Do you think they stayed in a cave with bugs and bats and rats? This man is one of the most unique men. Do you know how big he is? With all his achievements, raising the dead. Turning a nation upside down, terrifying a king. Do you know what? He can't get a place in Hebrews 11. What a majestic character. I can't read Hebrews 11 without going to tears. Do you read or are you dumb when you read it? Do you realize this man never had a Bible in his hand? Do you realize the people in Hebrews 11 who subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, not one of them ever had a Bible? You've got every word Almighty God has said or ever going to say. I like the hymn, Our Firmer Foundation. You remember one part of it says, What more can he say than to you he has said? If the world lasts another thousand years, God isn't going to add another chapter after Revelation. He said it. It's finished. Listen, God is not on trial in America. The church is, but he isn't. I think Shraggart and, and the, the other guys in PTL broke the heart of God. I believe Jesus will be weeping till he comes back over those men. They had the world at their feet and tossed it away for a bit of flesh. These men are dreadful men. There's a great American scholar, a Jewish scholar by the name of Bucks Basin. And years ago, he wrote, <coughs> he wrote a very wonderful exposition on Isaiah, or Isaiah if you like. 
I'd like to have met that man, but he's long since gone ahead of me. The box basin says this about a prophet. The prophet, by the very nature of his calling, is a tragic figure. He has a fierce loyalty to God, and he has a broken heart over the sin of the people. You see, we've got hundreds and hundreds of evangelists in America. What's that, brother? Where are you from? Carolina, is what you mean? Where is it now? I think it's coming. Oh, well, Ralph Sexton. Where are you, Ralph? Here, there? Bless you. Get some of these tapes. They stirred me. Not many things stirred me. But Ralph's uh, take the message. I'll tell you why. He's not one of these guys that comes for a one-night stand. He stays in the city for five, six, seven, and eight weeks until God moves. You see, evangelists live on, a, on God's faithful. If, uh, revivalists live on a faithful God. Evangelists normally raise funds. Revivalists raise hell. <laughs> America doesn't have a prophet tonight. I preached at a prophet's conference. My three brothers were there uh, about three months ago. 1,500 men from all over the country. They introduced me as a prophet, which I denied. I'm not a prophet. I speak with prophetic urgency. Because this is the most difficult hour in American history. It's not only the most critical hour in American history, it's the most critical hour in world history. By 1990 to 1992, America will have changed and it will never change back. What's the Minister of Education called? What's Bennett? Is that what? Who is it? Do you know what he said on the news this weekend? He said, listen, we're moving in a new direction. Things are going to change. Now here he is. He said, you know what? The white man's supremacy in America is finished. By the year 2000 to 2005, the number one population in America will be Hispanic. He didn't say that. I had this on. Number, number one population in America is Hispanic. Number two is black. And number three is white. Number one language will be Spanish. Number two will be English in the year 2000. So get your kiddies at least to be bilingual. We've had our day of privilege. I think the day of the Gentiles is fulfilled, Bracey. Do you think that? We've had the minority, I mean majority, we've done as we like, but that's over. But look how this man comes, you see. This man is a tragic figure. He comes to an atmosphere that's sold out to sensuality, idolatry, wickedness, violence, corruption of every kind. Let's run down this thing a minute here. In the same chapter, chapter 17, it says... In verse 30, Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. All right, 50 years before Elijah came onto the stage, uh, the most beautiful nation in the world, the most powerful in the world was Israel. But they got corrupted very quickly after the dividing of the kingdom. There had been an evil king. After him came a more evil king. The second king was more evil than the first. The third was more evil than the second. The fourth was more evil than the third. The fifth more evil than the fourth. The sixth more evil. Because he exceeded the iniquity, all the aggregate iniquity of all the people, this one king Ahab defied everybody. He loved everything that, was, that, wasn't, that didn't have virtue. He loved everything that was vile and corrupt. And it tells you what he did in verse 33. It says, Abraham made a grove. From verse 32. <coughs> he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Ahab made, did more to provoke the God of Israel to anger all the kings that were before him. And he rebuilt Bethel, it says in verse 34. So here you have this man, and God says to this man, do you get this? It is a man with a heart that flames to see his nation change. And God says, go hide thyself. Where's the sense? He's the only man around who's walking with God. Unless you say Elisha was there. But you see, this is a secret of his own life. The Lord says, go hide thyself. In chapter 18... And verse 1 it says, The Lord came in the third year and said, Go, I will send on the rain on the earth. 
Elijah went to show himself. Go show thyself. I was preaching in a certain place a while ago. One of the national leaders of a great movement in America was there. And he said, Mr. Raven, I went home and I pondered that word that you said, Go hide thyself. God has told me to hide myself. We have a young man coming to our prayer fellowship, which is Thursday mornings now if you pastors want to come. He's only a young man, but recently, and recently he, he, he earns very good money, but recently God said to him, you take one third of every day, take eight hours every day in prayer and Bible study. Then I met a man at, with some famous preachers two or three months ago, and he said the same thing. God has told me, now I have to give eight hours a day to Bible study and to prayer. What kind of men will they be in a year or two if they do that? Isn't it amazing what men will do? In the news the other morning it showed a young man. He's from China. He's come to learn how to box. He's gone to Gleason's famous, what do you call it, gymnasium in New York where a big preacher has gone. And they said to him, well, you come from China, yes. Do you miss China? Yes. He said, how long are you here? Till 1992, he said, three years ahead. I'm going to practice so many hours a day. Well, do you like the food here? Not very much. What's the hardest thing? I left my wife. We've been married less than two years. We have a baby six months old. I won't see my wife for two more years. I won't see my baby. But I'm going to be a boxer. He's so determined to do that. Now I read about these other fellows. All oh, the energy they put in to obtain what Paul calls a corruptible crown. You know the trouble with our generation, we've lost sight of eternity. We haven't, we're not living anymore in 2 Corinthians 4 where it says the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal. And God takes this man, this dramatic character, and he says, go hide thyself. And he goes into a cave. What do you think he did? Again, he wasn't studying botany, he wasn't studying rats. What did he do? I believe he prayed. Do you realize where this man is living? He's living right after the glorious days when the Shekinah, the glory of God, used to fill the temple and it's there no more. We don't see the Shekinah glory. Most of us don't even know what it is. We don't want it. We're happy to have little meetings. We're happy because we don't drink and smoke and swear and do some lousy things. But where are the God-filled men? Where are the sanctuaries where the presence is pregnant with deity and people move out and they don't talk when they leave and they don't light up cigarettes? They know they want God. So God has to get this man alone. And that's a hard thing. No man will ever be great for God unless he gets alone. Do you realize Moses, a third of his life, was on the back side of the desert? Read the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. He was a genius. He's learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He could maybe speak ten languages. He wrote it right before he gave the world the Ten Commandments. He made the laws for Egypt, the greatest nation in the world at that time. And yet God takes him away on the back side of the desert... How long do you think the colors were in his royal robe? He didn't stop and change his shoes, did he? And put on his sports attire. He went straight out of the palace of an angry king to the have company with God on the back side of the... But listen, you see, God is reserving something. As Peter said, there are some things reserved in heaven for us. God doesn't pay his bills now. Let me go back to this man Elijah for a minute. God had to get him in the quietness so he could hear the voice of God. And he's there for three years. Do you realize that's over a thousand days? I challenge you to get a thousand minutes alone. You turn the dreadful rotten TV on, or you'll call sister somebody or gossip to somebody else. Spend a thousand minutes in quiet, without any noise. Listen to God and see what God says. Can you and I take a thousand hours? Sometime when you have a vacation. Instead of going to see the east and see the others, go get quiet, go in a hotel and say, I'm going to fast and wait, wait on God for a number of days, a number of hours, a number of days. So this man goes, and for three years there he is. I don't believe when this man went out from the busy life he had, he left a, a, he left a calling card or forward my mail or 
send me some food or ask all the people that love me to send me food if there's no food send stamps and if they can't send stamps send me money this man is under orders from God and he moves he only, he only moves when God says go he doesn't ask any questions don't you think he could have turned around and said Lord this isn't fair I'm living in the most vile corrupt generation of people they have their sex parties every night they're drunk every night they're sensual every night they're devilish every night they're just like the people here in Dallas tonight it's as cu corruption as lousy as New York but it doesn't trouble us we're a broken nation we more homes broken with divorce we more children's hearts broken over parents who are divorced we more broken minds with drugs we more broken bodies with drink America is held siege tonight like England and the rest of the world we're held by debt and disease and drugs and devilry and witchcraft and we've no power the greatest thing we need now is men who touch God we've touched everything else isn't it silly to say the best thing to, way to fight crime is to build new jails so that the best way to get healthy is to give everybody a free casket isn't that wonderfully logical you see everything's out of control the economy's out of control with its trillions of dollars in debt everything's out of control vice is out of control we don't know what to do with the crime we're trying to find an answer we don't need a nation to destroy I don't believe Russia's going to send bombs into this country we're going to kill ourselves we're on a, we're on a, a mission right now to self-destruct I read this week that at least a hundred thousand people with AIDS in America who are known and there's many more that are not known but look again is this man equipped what's he doing sitting in that rotten old filthy place look at the rats then he's looking every day he doesn't run out and say Lord please don't let anybody kill the little bird that's been my breakfast he wasn't trusting the bird he's trusting God most of the evangelists today they don't trust God a faithful God they trust God faithful there's a big difference you can tell when a, when a ministry runs on money instead of faith it screams over TV send us money or we'll have to go off the air well be, help God send, don't send money let them go off the air be, be, be the biggest blessing in America if they went off the air if God doesn't get them off the air one way will get them off the other way this is a crisis out in America our nation is doomed and our neighbors are damned and we don't care two things are always very very pregnant in revival number one is a prayer meeting number two is a street meeting do you realize the revival that shook England from center to the conference under the Wesleys was never in a building it was always in the streets do you realize that when the power of God was on uh, in the early days of uh, George Whitfield in this country the people stood in snow up to their knees for two or three hours to listen to him do you realize the difference between just playing church on Sundays as good as we are your pastor hits all the bases you all went to church yesterday because you knew you didn't hear spiritual nursery rhymes you have a nice little pastor he never upset you God pity him you ought to preach some days you go home blazing mad I think some of you will tonight at least I prayed you will you're going to get hurt tonight you're going to face issues tonight not because of me but because of God it's later than we think in America we haven't much time left by the year 1992 what oh they, 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 they're going to have what uh, European common market is going to have uh, what do you call it now a universal money system and it will be greater than the Japanese system Japan's going out of the picture Europe's coming into the picture America won't be in the picture financially in every other way we're going to be made to cast ourselves on God I was reading today listen Ezekiel 14 let me read it quickly the word of the Lord came unto me it says in the 40th chapter of Ezekiel in verse 12 
the word of the Lord came unto me now listen to verse 14 listen very carefully though these three men Noah Daniel and Job were in it that's if they pray they will not save anybody but their own souls look again in verse 16 though these three men were in it as I live said the Lord God they shall not deliver their sons or their daughters they only shall be delivered and verse 18 though these three men were in it as I live saith the Lord they shall not deli deliver their sons or their daughters it goes down in verse 20 and yes says the same thing and yet verse 22 says yet behold therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth both of sons and daughters in any other words there comes a time when God turns away from us he's been calling us we won't listen and we'll call him and he won't listen in America did God love the children of Israel why did he cut them off in Malachi and Malachi to Matthew 400 years of darkness without any spiritual light 400 years of stillness without any prophetic voice listen we're much nearer judgment than we realize here in America you can't have more Bible schools in this nation than all the world has outside 600 million Bibles how many of them are being used today how many people really know what a real Holy Ghost prayer meeting is some of these good men that are here have come to our prayer meeting for 10 years 500 Friday night prayer meetings there were tears and brokenness and I treasure their friendship not because they're rich and famous but because when they pray they move me to tears I realize the power of God but listen here is Elijah he doesn't, have a, he doesn't have a book this isn't a book it's a library 66 most precious books in the world he didn't have them in his pocket I don't think he sent a word down to Elisha listen I'm going to hide in a cave for years send me some help he cut off from Elijah there are times when God won't let you trust in anyone at all you do as God says and so there he was waiting there don't you think he might have said listen Lord this isn't fair the first man they ever read of in the Bible was a majestic man he'd never seen a priest he'd never seen a sacrifice he'd never seen an altar he'd never seen a Bible he'd never heard anybody preach and yet one day he went down Main Street and he yelled at the top of his voice the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment that's the word of a prophet that's a man who doesn't care a hill of beans about the persecution of the opposition Enoch walked with God the man who walks with God is never alone the man who walks with God is never poor the man who is rich and doesn't walk with God is poor I don't care how much land he owns I don't care how big his church may be the devil isn't afraid of numbers he's afraid of God filled men so Elijah is there in the cave he prayed and prayed and prayed he doesn't say anything about his tears but you can't walk with God and not have tears don't you think he of later Elijah says where is the Lord God of Elijah I think Elijah says where is the God of Enoch please manifest yourself just once give us one more chance show us your glory again show my generation your she kind of glory show us your majesty do you remember when the angel came to what's, what's wait a minute. when the angel came to Gideon and the angel says God is with thee thou mighty man of valor do you know what he did he turned to the angel and said do angels tell jokes what do you mean God is with us where are the miracles our fathers told us of you've gone to church for 20 years and never seen a miracle and it doesn't bother you either a physical miracle or a spiritual miracle you see when revival comes as dear Dr. Tozer used to say to me often remember Leonard when revival truly comes it changes the moral climate of a community that's what it does there's a little book being published I thought I didn't bring a copy of it I was going to show you it anyhow I brought the details of it this is from a book that's recently been put out by the Banner of Truth it's called Come Down Lord it's about revival listen to this if I tell you what happened in the days of Whitfield who says 200 years ago well listen this happened in a country called America in a city called Denver I'll give you the date it says this 
I read in the newspaper recently of an awakening in Denver in 1905 under the preaching of Wilbur Chapman. The Denver Post says in his headline, The entire city, this January 20th, 1905, that the uh, Denver Post says, The entire city pauses for, for, pauses for prayer even at high noon. An entire city. Nobody wanted to shop. Nobody wanted to go to the bank. God was moving. They didn't know what the next manifestation would be. Maybe a prayer meeting would break out in Sears Roebox or somewhere. Suddenly business was transformed and a holy God came in sovereign power. He's not, we're not going to direct the Holy Ghost. Some of these boys in the seminary are trying to teach the Holy Ghost. He came to teach us. We better get into line otherwise he'll desert us. Forget my English for a minute. A young man came in my office last week, last year rather, charming young guy, rough. I want to give him a dollar, I want to give him 50 cents for his shoes and his, and his hat and everything he had. He had a pack on his back. He and his two brothers had been in Nicaragua. They'd been with the Sandinistas where bullets were flying past. And the three men worked together, these three brothers. And they told me about the power of God. <laughs> that they'd witnessed there but this is the thing he said to me he said Mr. Ray you spent more than half a century praying yes never I live another half I'll do it he said but don't you realize this God's favor isn't here he said look we've got the greatest army in the world now he's an American forget my tongue We've got the greatest army in the world, we've got the greatest air force in the world, we've got the greatest navy in the world, but we can't liberate ten fine young Americans in Lebanon who are rotting in prison cells there. We've got a man in, Nick we've got a man in Panama, Noriego, he thumbs his nose at us every day, we can't get him out of there. We're totally helpless. Our strength is no good in military power. Our God is not going to deliver America through technology. He's going to deliver it through theology. God ordained, God energized theology. These big shots have had their days and never been any more swaggers and never, more, never any more PTL by the grace of God. He's going to raise up men from the Carolinas. He's going to raise a black boy that was driving a bus today in Alabama. He's going to raise somebody we don't know. Nobody knew where Enoch was. Nobody knew where Elijah was. He's hidden in a cave. But he never moved, and here's his secret, until he heard the voice of God. He doesn't say, Lord, I ask for revelation. I want to see the coming Jesus, because outside of where I live, it's opposition, it's ridicule, it's every form of sensuality, excessive iniquity, uncleanness. The nightclubs are full with naked, lusting, lying people. And here I am sitting here. Lord, I want to get up and go. Don't you think people said the same about the Apostle Paul? Somebody comes on a tour and they say, Who's in that prison cell there? It's a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. Or by the name of Paul. Maybe they didn't call him St. Paul then. It's a man there in the backside of a prison cell. A prison cell running with rats. A lousy prison cell. And here's one of the greatest men that ever lived. My brother here teasing me when I say he had a colossal intellect. I believe Paul was the greatest genius that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. But there he is in a prison cell. Doing what? Writing love letters to the Philippians. Writing love letters to the Thessalonians. Writing love letters to the Romans. Dear God, what's he doing there? That man can raise the dead. That man can cast out devils. Get up and get going. You see, we're activists. We're all busy. Busy doing nothing. I guarantee most of you preachers when we went to bed last night not a demon in hell was terrified. He said he's been asleep all day anyhow. Let him sleep all night. Some of you guys want to be famous in your denomination. Forget the denomination. Maybe it's an abomination. Get to the place where all that matters with you is you're filled with God. Your heart is filled with the love of God. Your eyes are filled with the vision of God. And your will is filled with the will of God. Listen, what we've had in evangelism in the last 25 years has not moved America. We're more sinful, we've more divorces, 
We more sex, we more crime, we more AIDS than we had 25 years ago. A million dollar crusade hasn't done anything. Why in God's name do preachers need million dollar homes, million dollar swimming pools, million dollar aeroplanes? What good is it? I'd rather have no shoes and nothing to eat with the anointing of God than have all these creature comforts that men have. Since when has Almighty God, well, has the devil been afraid? Listen, I'll tell you what the power of God is. Don't ask for it unless you mean suffering. Today we want a painless Pentecost. There isn't such a thing as a painless Pentecost. Pentecost in the Bible meant persecution, pain, privations, poverty, and prison. Oh, there's a Pentecostal preacher in prison now. He should be there a hundred years. Do you want a testimony that will kick you out of your pulpit? Or are you trying to preserve your little wife and children? And Listen, I've lived without income as it were for 66 years. I've never sent out a newsletter. My precious son has been on the mission field 30 years, never once asked for a dime. And he's five children and he has to pay for his ten radio stations a month in advance. He can't come crying, I'm behind, I'm behind. I wish those guys would get so far behind to get lost. <coughs> but listen, I tell you what, we're going to have to prove what we've taught in theology. We're going to have to eat it before very long. We're running into a crisis in America and parallel in American history. America has never been more religious than she is at this moment and she's never had less power. You say, what about England? She's as rotten as America. In fact, there are more clergymen in England with AIDS than there are in America. That's nothing to boast of. My country gave the world the Bible. My country gave the world the Wesleyan revival. My country gave the world the Salvation Army revival that went into 90, 70 countries in 90 years. William Booth stepped on the gutter. His wife had a curvature of the spine. He had no money, he had no assets. She said, William, what are we going to do? He said, darling, we'll go for the worst and they stepped out and eventually they had a Holy Ghost revival they've lost their anointing now but who hasn't, that's fashionable but listen I'll tell you what I'd like to be on the devil's list of most wanted men in America would you? you really mean that? because you may be before the week's out sure the apostle was the greatest theologian ever Look at the majesty of the epistle to the Romans. Look how they unveils the second coming of the Lord Jesus. But then he unveils the cross. The majesty of the cross. You see, in our day we've forgotten two things. The average preacher that's there has lost sight of the awesome beauty and thrilling majesty of the gospel. Wesley says over and over and over in his wonderful, wonderful diaries. I looked at them the other day. John Wesley says, I went to Wednesbury or I went to Lancashire, or I went to London, or I went to Birmingham. And what did he do? He said, I offered men Christ. We don't offer men Christ. We offer forgiveness. We offer pardon. We offer peace. We offer prosperity now. Forget it. Let's get back to the old rugged cross. Amen. There's no substitute for it. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto him. We're not preaching Christ. Listen to Charles Wesley. Charles put his brother's theology to music. Charles Wesley says this, My heart is full of Christ. Not my head is full of theology. My heart is full of Christ and longs this glorious message to declare. Here you have a young man, a brilliant scholar like his brother, teaches in Oxford University. So what happened? One day, yeah, Mrs. Well, the old mother Wesley, she's a wonderful woman. She has 17 children. That doesn't make her wonderful, but she has 17 children. She found a copy of a little book which has been republished fairly recently. It's been published more than any other book in England except the Bible and uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It's called A Life of God in the Soul of Man by Henry Scougal. Listen, being born again isn't giving up lousy habits. What's the good of having your name on a church roll? You may as well as have it on an egg roll. I'd rather have the egg roll, it's better taste in it anyhow. Do you know what? Here's a book you've got to get, you preachers. 
getting evangelicals saved isn't that a job Do you know what preaching is? It's 30 minutes to raise the dead. I go to churches, this is different, you, I guess you're all alive. I go to churches, every row I see in churches, death row, they're dead in trespass and in sin. They've gone to church for 20 years and never felt the power of conviction. We've lost all sight of conviction and the power of God. It's all psychology. Listen, you never get, you can rub two ice cubes together from now till you die, you'll never get a spark. And if you're rubbing your theology on the psychology, you'll die dead too. There'll be no fire. But listen to what this says. I want you to get a copy of this written by a friend of mine, Paris Reed. I hope you get him sometime, Brady, at your church. He's a fabulous preacher. He's been a mystery for 30 years. Let me get this for a moment and read it to you, if I can find it. Here it is. You can assume you're saved, he says. With a third and fourth and fifth generation where we stand to the gay day, the gospel has been obscured. We find today, if you just say this and say, ooh, ah, afterwards, you're declared saved. And then he says, probably, now listen. This is in the greatest Baptist, Southern Baptist Church in Spartanburg. That's where our brother lives, somewhere up there. The greatest, uh, let me read it correctly. The, the practice led the pastor of a large church in Memphis. Memphis, Adrian Rogers is there now. Uh, to make a bold statement, once before the Southern Baptist Convention in Spartanburg, Carolina, he declared on the base in his 40 years of close observation in the church listen, this is an, an established, distinguished uh, Southern Baptist preacher I preached with him not long ago he's a principal guy and he says probably not more than one out of ten of the Southern Baptists experientially know anything about the new birth that's not a criticism from a Pentecostal it's one of the finest men I've ever preached with he has a what, 10, 12,000 membership away there in Memphis, Tennessee and he says most of the people in the Baptist church are not even born again Carl F. Henry says he made a survey and he says 20% of church members that he contacted never prayed 25% never read the Bible 30% don't attend Sunday school 90% never had family prayers come on, you're a Sunday school teacher, a deacon do you have family prayers in your house every day? No, neither do they in Russia. You better get your children indoctrinated. They're going to live in a hell of a world. Why schools are jungles now? What did they say yesterday on the, on the news? There were one million school children who got involved in crime last year. Children nine years of age have got involved in sex. It, it's a tragic hour in which we live. The, the world is broken, people's minds are broken, families are broken, hearts are broken, bodies are broken, nerves are broken, but the church isn't heartbroken about it. We couldn't care less. When did you last end your prayer meeting in tears? Why, dear God, you've got a daddy and mummy not saved. Oh, but my son-in-law is a preacher. Will that be a comfort when they're in hell? You know, one of the agonies of hell will be, they'll see straight into heaven. They'll see Daddy and Mummy at the marriage supper of the Lamb while they're burning in hell forever. And they'll be turning Daddy and Mummy's name over. How do I know? Because Jesus said there was a man, and he's in Abraham's bosom, and there's a man in hell, and he sees Abraham, he sees Davis in the bosom of Abraham, typical of heaven. And so from the blackness of hell, he could look into heaven, and he could see that man in comfort. What an agonizing thing. Some of you people, you care more about your Sunday school children than your own children. You take more concern about ruling the church than ruling your own house. How many of you men are really king in the home and priest in the home? I better get off that. Except on the next page it mentions that Dr. Tozer says just about the same thing. He says in my denomination, which is Christian Missionary Alliance, he said they, Dr. Tozer, Dr. Tozer made the same sad observation among evangelical churches including the society of which I'm a part 
and he was the, the leading preacher in the Christian Missionary Alliance he says in the churches and the society of which I'm a part probably not more than when one out of ten or anything experientially about the new birth it's exactly what the Baptist brother has said isn't it look I make an appeal here I'm not going to ask you for a thing do you know what we're dying of in America we're all the stuff with teaching and no preaching where are the preachers where is the thus saith the Lord you talk about Spurgeon I was in a, having a meal in a house in 1937 I went for a snack in a very gorgeous home full of antiques and Persian rugs and everything else and the old lady was sitting on a chair with carved arms and a, a, a plush seat and back a little thing on her head no lace collar and she said oh I'm so glad to see you I wanted you to come for a year my daughters, my girls, she said, are girls. One was 72, one was 74, so take courage, you old girls. <laughs> my girls go to the first Baptist Sunday morning, but they come to the tabernacle to hear you Sunday night. And Miss Rainey, I want to tell you something. I said, do. She said, you preach just like Spurgeon. I said, please, please. She said, my daughters make notes, and they come home, we sit round the fire, and we, we, uh, I listened to them, oh, Mr. Raymond said, but Mr. Raymond said it like this, you know, he gets excited about it. He, he makes you want to believe it. It makes you believe there is a hell and there is a heaven. It makes you believe that Jesus is waiting to receive us. And she said, you know, when they're talking like that, I say, you know, Spurgeon used to do that. And I said, dear lady, I, oh, I just realized you are 95, aren't you? She said, yes. Did you hear Spurgeon? Oh, hear him, she said. He was wonderful. But Mr. Raymond, you know, it was when he preached he was wonderful. Very often it was when he prayed. He lifted us into eternity when he prayed. You may as well have a parrot in your church. Or a tape recorder. Oh, we'll ask Deacon Smith to pray. And he said, Lord, bless the service this morning. Bless the preacher. Bless the offering. Bless the choir. Amen. Thank you. Drop dead. Listen, you ought to have sold it in eternity for five, six days in the week. You're glad to come down to earth and share what you've seen. Yeah. You ought to come with the power of another world upon you. Yeah. In the days of Alexander White, there was a, a man, he was a great Shakespeare actor in his day, and he was packing a theatre up the road, so that every day the press said the theatre was packed last night, standing room only, they turned 3,000 people away. The preacher went and looked the next day, and people were going up the road, and there they were packing the theatre and turning away. So he sent notice to the preacher, he said, would you like to drop in and see me? I pastor the greatest church in this town. But he said, my church is only three quarters full. He said, sir, is it true that everywhere you go, you pack the theatre to the brim? He said, yes. He said, what's the secret? He said, preacher, could it be this? I make artificial things look real, and you make real things look artificial? Is that true in your church? But listen, there are things you don't know about Spurgeon. There's a new biography of him out. You need to read. Do you know what he did? He was saved at 15 years of age. After what? After seven weeks of conviction. Dear God, you talk about abortion. There are more people, ab people aborted spiritually yesterday in America than were aborted all last week in the hospitals. They come to the front, they're not born again. The preacher says, say this, no one ever got saved by, re by repeating Romans 9 and 10. With the heart man believes, not memory. Listen, you preachers at the judgment seat of Christ will be charged with gross or criminal negligence. Why? Let me say this quickly. I don't listen to much TV, but I like animals and I like, I like to see some things going on. So they said, tonight on TV we're going to show you the birth of a giraffe.